Hello. We are here as a gathering to talk, to have a conversation, two, two people, but you who watch us on television, join into the conversation as well. Talk to about yourself and talk to about the, your life and, and listen to this marvelous stories that we have to share with you today. Francois Clemens is our, our guest and our partner. And uh, Francois, we are so pleased that you could do this today. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. We're, and we were, we were just uh, prompted by uh, wanting to do this for a long time, but also by the fact that you announced recently that you were going to do your last concert. So maybe we could start. How do, start at the how end. Do you, how do, yeah, <laughs> how, how do you feel about it? Well, one of the reasons I felt I wanted to do a, a reasonable farewell concert uh, is that I can still sing. I didn't want to wait until <laughs> I was croaking. <laughs> so I decided I had had a, a lot of very, very, very positive experiences. I would continue to accept guest appearances. But it uh, became uh, evident to me that a lot of people were asking me to talk about my book and to speak about my philosophy of unconditional love, speak about my relationship with Fred Rogers. And I realized that there were opportunities coming in that did not require the focus on singing mm -hmm. exclusively. So um, I decided that I wanted to be with friends. So I felt like I, w I had invited friends to come to my living room, mm -hmm. which of course was the sanctuary at CVUUS. And there I had a chance to say I love you by mm -hmm. singing American Negro Spirituals. I discovered um, uh, uh, out of this world love for spirituals back in 1975 or 76. A gentleman hired me uh, in a group that sang spirituals, but we toured Italy. And oh my God, the Italians went crazy over this wonderful song, Literature. Mm -hmm. So when I came home, I remember saying to Emery, was his name, I have not had enough. <laughs> yeah. I, I want more. And he said, if you want more, you should start your own group, and I'll do whatever I can to help you, any suggestions and all that kind of, and he was very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, because he helped me to reach out to the musical community in Harlem, Mm -hmm. Brooklyn, Manhattan, of course, the Bronx, wherever people were. I got, got on the phone, I called a few, we got together, and lo and behold, it was wonderful. They were people who were singers, but who were not at the Metropolitan Opera or New York City Opera, and they had taken other jobs in order to pay their rent mm -hmm. and uh, to pay their health insurance and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but they loved singing. And some of them were absolutely excellent. I mean, world-class excellent. And I was able to pick and choose from there my, a high soprano, a lyric soprano, a mezzo soprano. I sang tenor. I had a baritone and a bass. And I, I managed to get us together and say, now listen to him, now listen to her, so that we could form a unique choral sound. It was fantastic. This... Uh and tell, tell us the name. It was the Harlem Spiritual Ensemble. Right. And we were located in, in Manhattan. Harlem is in Manhattan. And we traveled, literally, when I put the group together, I thought the, uh, the, the musical agent, Thea Disbecker, would say, oh, you're fantastic. Off to Europe, off to Germany, Austria. No. Well, we discovered this incredible audience of college campuses, mm -hmm. University of Michigan, Harvard, go down to the uh, uh, traditional black colleges, Tuskegee, Fisk. We sang at all of them, and they loved the spirituals. I thought they would be <laughs> judgmental. i say, you northerners coming back down here singing these songs that the slaves created. But they did not. They said, thank you so much that you loved the repertoire so much that you took the time to put this group together. And we stayed together about 25, 26 years. Mm. Uh, like with any ordinary uh, arts organization, we were constantly having financial problems. Mm -hmm. And I was constantly looking for mentors. And uh, I found them, and they were 
very generous. I have to say that. They were very generous. But nevertheless, the finances began to overcome me and the group, and we talked about it. Uh, we couldn't think of other ways to raise money. We had fundraisers. We did very, very well. And still, it was a very expensive undertaking. Mm -hmm. um, we were that second level of artists who travel and sing all the time, but who are not going to win Grammys and, you know, uh, going to be on NBC News or something every night. Mm -hmm. But everywhere we went, we were highly appreciated. I can't tell you how my heart opened. Whether we were in Austria, Germany, or France, or we went to Asia, oh my God, the Koreans, the Japanese loved the spirituals. They loved us because I was presenting them and I cleaned out all the modern junk and uh, stuff that they do to spirituals so that you could experience the real thing. A lot of people mix it up with gospel music. Gospel music is music that we know who the composer is or was. And that person says, let's do Steal Away this way, or let's do Swing Low this way. Spirituals, on the other hand, was specifically the music of slaves in the fields in the South. Can, can you give us a couple examples? Oh, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. Coming for to carry me home, swing low, Lord, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me home. Now that's the spirituals were like that. That was the tempo. They were they were not fast, mm -hmm. and they the text is, swing low, sweet chariot. Coming for it's call and, and response. Coming for to carry me home. Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. And they would sing while they were working at that pace. There was almost always a song leader, and that song leader was put in a conspicuous place where he was accessed. If you had a good voice, to be honest, like mine, I think I would have been a song leader. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, the slaves had to sing everything from memory. They were not allowed to learn to read or write and 99% of them did not. So everything had to be able to, uh, to learn through rote. And I realized that I had this gift for rote singing. You can sing anything and I can harmonize it. I mm -hmm. didn't realize that I was given this gift as a boy boy because when I got to fourth grade, my voice was not as high as some of the beautiful boy uh, male uh, choral Catholic Gregorian chants and literature. Mm -hmm. So I, I said, I can't sing those high notes. And the teacher said, well, what can you sing? And I sang a harmony. And she said, where did you get that? And I said, I don't know. I hear it. She said, okay, when they sing that, you, I want to hear what you have to sing. And I demonstrated for her. She was very oh. kind. And she said, well, I'll be darned. So after that, for the rest of the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, I sang Boy Alto. Mm -hmm. And many times she would teach the, uh, us kids in class a song, and I harmonized it just sitting there listening. I was a little bit of a busybody. And she said, I hear you. What are you singing? And I said, yeah, she said, yep, you got it. So I had a gift. And then when I got to eighth grade, my voice started changing, and I almost quit. But my music teacher, two of them, in seventh and eighth grade said, if you keep coming to the music class and being with us and sh participating, We'll make sure you pass this course. But if you can't quit now, oh, I was so close. Singing for your supper. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> you know? I, I really enjoyed it. And I, I found that my singing gave a lot of people pleasure constantly. And it wasn't just the spirituals. If I sang pop music like Frankie Lyman or something from uh, Detroit, the uh, Motown sound, they liked that too. So it was something that. I began to understand the power that was given to me as, at my birth as a gift. My mother sang, my grandmother sang, my great-grandmother sang. I remember all of them. And when I sing, the voice of these women uh, t takes over my persona. And I sing the voice and the pain and the suffering and the joy mm -hmm. of my ancestors. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not just casually loving spirituals. I sing them because... They're a very powerful part of me. 
Mm -hmm. And I began to understand that. And so when I, I even won the Metropolitan Opera auditions in Pittsburgh, I got to New York, and the, the assistant um, manager of the Metropolitan Opera said, would you sing me a spiritual? I've heard about you. And I thought, what have you heard? <laughs> and he said, you sing, go down Moses, way down in Egypt land, tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. That's Same powerful. Thing. That's powerful. That's yeah. what he said, yeah. that you've got a gift. There's something uh, transformative. Mm -hmm. So I do a lot of meditation. I, uh, I've never smoked cigarettes. I like vodka, so I'll have a drink, red wine sometimes in the evening. I find that there is a sense of purity. And I'm 78, and I still can sing. Yes, so I you think can. I feel it's a gift. But I have to, I don't want to say be cleansed. But I can't smoke cigarettes. I can't vape or vape, vape or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. I, I can't do the, I don't, I've never done cocaine, no, no crackhead. None of those appealed to me because I discovered in fourth grade that if I had a puff of a cigarette, my throat hurt. Right. Oh, my God. I, it was so unpleasant, so unhappy. Forget it. I told my buddies who were sneaking and smoking, don't call me anymore. Don't ask me. I'm not coming because that is too uh, unpleasant. So I don't do anything that makes me feel I'm not in control of my voice. My voice tells me what I can do and what I cannot do. Mm -hmm. I don't stay up all night, except I see you have my book, Officer Clemens there. Yes. I stayed up many nights writing that. Many nights writing it. But let, me, I, let me hold that up <laughs> yes. so people can see. It took me, I, I joke, 26 years to write that. Well, and how I long said, did it take you? Well, uh, I started uh, um, writing journals as I traveled around the world. Okay. And uh, there were times when I felt I, I needed to be quiet. Either I was tired or um, I had a gig coming up. So I began to keep notebooks, uh, date, uh, some kind of a date calendar that I could write in. And I wrote in that, and when I would get back to Manhattan, I had a friend. I would give her those notes and she typed them up. I had 6,000 pages. Oh my well, God. nobody's gonna publish 6,000 pages. No, no. So I went to, um, uh, I sent samples out. I got a woman that said, I'm, a, I'm an editor for uh, uh, Maria Carvena's uh, uh, literary agency and I wanna work with you. I like what, your style. And, but she said, your book is much too long. Now we've got to find a way to cut. So I went to see what they call a book doctor. Mm -hmm. Someone who sat down with me and we went through this, we went through that, we changed chronologies. And the other thing he said to me, the experience in the beginning of going through a hurricane like the Katrina hurricane, he said to me, I want it from the little boy's perspective and his panic. What does that boy think about? Because mm -hmm. I had already written the third person safe and I, 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 I was over here. And the hurricane was over there. And he said, no, I want you to get right in there, and I want you to talk about it. So I spent a lot of time with this wonderful man in New York telling him. I would speak, and he was, we'd make copies of it. Very wise guy. Well, he was, and he was very uh, honest, which was important to mm -hmm. me. But he was also gentle and kind, and he had um, uh, empathy. So that when I was writing about some very tender, special scenes, I knew that I was speaking to someone who... Who understood. Yes, who understood. Yeah, so yeah. I continued to write, and sure enough, we cut out, we got down to about 300 pages or so. Mm -hmm. And my literary agent, Elizabeth, said, okay, let's send this out and see if we can get a publisher. So we sent them out. She did. She did all of that. I sent them out, and we got a lot of rejections. So I, the book I wrote at first was called Diva Man, My Life in Song. And that was mostly about singing and all that. Mm -hmm. And she said, stop, stop writing anymore. You have all this stuff about Mr. Rogers. Let's uh, focus on Fred Rogers. I said, what? I've already spent all this time. So I, I went back into the studio and I started writing about Fred Rogers, mm -hmm. the deep personal relationship 
He was so loving and so kind to me. He was the first man that ever told me he loved me. And it, it, my heart thumped, mm -hmm. and I came alive. You love me, I said to Fred. He said, yes, I've been talking to you for two or three years, but you just heard me today. Mm -hmm. Well, I will be darned. Yeah. I was ne I've never been the same because he, uh, he literally adopted me. I became a surrogate son. And he said to me, whatever's going on in your life, Francois, there are going to be some tough times. There are things that we'll disagree, but I will always be there for you. You'll yeah. never uh, have to wonder or worry, where is Fred? How does Fred feel? He said, because I love you. Well, I've, I've never been the same. Mm -hmm. And so that went inside of me. And so when I sang and I auditioned for people, I auditioned with the knowledge that I had a very, very special person who loved me. Mm -hmm. And now, I, I'm skipping over a lot of the details, but they're in the book. If you buy the book, you'll get some, some good stuff. But what I discovered was singing was an application, or it was who I am, t the total person. When I sing, I don't just use my voice. I communicate. Mm -hmm. And Fred Rogers said, I give you unconditional love, Francois. Well, I couldn't stop thinking about that. Mm -hmm. for the, like the next three or four years. And all during that period of time, I understood how much love I had inside of me, how much love I had to give. So my singing took on a different flavor, a different color. And I began to want to, to a, uh, experience and share peace in the world, mm -hmm. unconditional love. So everywhere I go now, that's my message. We are one. I, I don't believe in racism. I don't believe in certain kinds of sexism. I don't judge. I don't try to uh, put anybody down. I sing to people that they're blind. I had a bunch of uh, people in Pittsburgh who were all officially deaf. And they came to me and they put their hands all over my body and I sang. Hmm. Oh, still away. They had their hands. Still away. Still our way to Jesus. Still our way, still our way home. I ain't got long to stay. a nice note that's beautiful and those guys held on to me yeah 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 it was one of the most wonderful experiences I've ever had yeah we were all one there was so much they hugged me almost to death <laughs> I mean they after I stopped they hugged and they hugged and the person who was running the institute there in Pittsburgh said some of them here a little bit or they hear enough, but the vibration, they get my body vibrates as I mm -hmm. sing. So that's mm -hmm. what they were. Oh, what a trans, trans, transcendental experience. It transcends you to another, another level. Sure. And so I wanted to write that in the book. I wanted people to understand the experiences that I've had and the lessons that I've learned that make me want to share. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, uh, I wrote the second book, which my agent asked me about, Fred Rogers, and she sent it out. And people sent her back and said, can you put that first book, Diva Man, My Life and Song, with Fred Rogers? I said, I've already, <laughs> I had already spent so much time. So she and I sat down and we really did. We looked at each other and said, well, are you gonna do it or aren't you? It's up to you. Mm -hmm. And I sat down and said, I, okay, I will do it. It's gonna take time. She said, that's okay, send me copies Every two or three days, don't wait until you're finished. Okay. Send me and let me see how. So I sat down and I began to, like you braid hair, I began to braid our experiences together with the help of the, um, uh, the, the doctor in New York City. And sure enough, I finally said, okay, here is what I have done. And she read, she said, okay, I'm ready to send it out. So she sent that out. And lo and behold, we got nine requests, people who wanted to publish it. And I was just beside myself with 
it was worth all the storm und drunk, all the uh, lonely nights, many mm -hmm. nights alone, mm -hmm. while I was working on it or trying to fashion it in a way that would be acceptable to my manager and agent and all that. And sure enough, uh, we decided on Catapult. They have a wonderful uh, um, business office there in Manhattan. And I went down to see them. And I was in a, a, a like a boardroom where there were maybe 20 people sitting around these tables. And I said, have all of you guys read my book? Oh, yes, we all, we had to. The boss told us we had to <laughs> read it. So anyway, that's how I got it published. And um, I've been great. going around. Uh, I did the movie, Won't You Be My Neighbor, with, um, oh, Lord, what is his name? Anyway, wonderful director. And I did that movie, and he said, would you come to California and talk at the opening? So they would show the movie, and then we do a QA. and a And I did Q&As in Chicago and Detroit and Cleveland and Nashville and everywhere that the movie was premiering. I became the person who was, they said, we have a guest here today. After the movie is over, don't leave. Well, they, they stayed, and they stayed, and they stayed, mm -hmm. and they stayed. Yeah. <laughs> so you can see, I'm an extrovert, and I do talk. Uh, you, I don't need uh, <laughs> to be led what punches. <laughs> no. uh, that's a gift also. I'm spontaneous. My singer, one of my singers, whom I, I adore, I love her very much, Janet Jordan, said, Maestro, you have never met a stranger. Mm-hmm. We watch you. We see how you talk and how they respond. Because as soon as I'm, well, when I wake up in the morning, my heart starts opening up and I'm saying yes to the universe. Yes, I want to be here. Yes, I love what I'm doing. I'm traveling. Sometimes it's inconvenient. The food is not right. The bathrooms are different. I mean, all, you know, the fundamentals mm -hmm. that I say. But I'm glad to be here. I love it. So I did that. Final concert, and I've sung about five times since it, since I did it, and uh, that's what I want to continue to do. Um, special appearances, where uh, college campuses. Uh, what what songs uh, do, do people ask you to sing? Well, uh, the, the, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Oh Lord, yeah, this little light of mine. Uh, I'm gonna let it shine, uh, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh That's my. probably the number one song, this little light of mine. But Swing Low Sweet Chariot, Bomb and Gilead, I've, I've done uh, a number of them. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing Jacob's ladder. Oh, we are climbing, Lord. So that's what I do now. So wherever you are, there's a concert, <laughs> right? Yes, because I can sing a cappella. That's right. And, and we, we say thank you for that. I, thank I, you for inviting me. Oh, glad to. And, and uh, one la any last thing you would like to share? Uh, we, we've got a few more minutes. Well, I'm in the state of Vermont, so people can contact me here if they want me to come to Ohio or they know somebody who's booking an artist in Louisiana or California. Okay. I want to travel. And uh, so I'm hoping that people will contact me and say, oh, you've never sung out here for us in Kentucky or in Arkansas or Montana. Come on out here and sing. We, we got a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah. I hope that's the case for you. I uh, hope so, too. And, very much so. And it's nice to have you as a neighbor. Yes, neighbor. And, you are a real and, neighbor. And, and uh, we're looking forward to that continuing. You know, uh, you mentioned the word neighbor. 
There are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. Many ways, many ways, many ways to say I love you. Now that's a great way for us to end this conversation. <laughs> we hopefully will have more. Yes. And we give thanks uh, for you who are watching, and please share uh, these experiences, and uh, your deep appreciation comes. Thank you very much. Okay.